Everybody, what's up? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. This is Shot Science Overtime number 73, I believe. Um, and today we have a special guest with us, which I will get to in just a second. But I just want to remind you guys that if you have questions that you want answered today about basketball, anything basketball, it can be about shooting, dribbling, defense, rebounding, passing, whatever, make sure that you're sending them to us either t in the chat here on the on YouTube, or you can send them to us on Google Plus in the Q&A app here for this video, or you can send them to us on our Twitter. We are at Shot Science on Twitter, and usually we are able to get to those questions first because Twitter is just super easy to use. So tweet them at us, at Shot Science, and we will try to get to everybody's question. Um, and in the meantime, while we wait for you guys to send us uh, as many questions as you possibly can, uh, we're going to talk about a topic today with our guest. And uh, hopefully it'll be something that'll help you with your shooting, um, help you kind of take you to the next level uh, in terms of a workout that you can use to become a better shooter. But before we do that, I want to introduce our guest for today, who is Coach Dennis Stanton. And uh, Coach Stanton has uh, you know a long history as a player, and now he's working as a coach. And uh, we came across his videos through a, a mutual friend, and we were just... Uh, very very happy to see somebody that that just knows knows shooting knows about the mechanics and knows how to apply those things uh, into a workout and into playing in actual games. So I want to welcome Coach Stanton and uh, hopefully he can give us a little bio here on himself. So what's up? What's up, Dennis? Uh, what's going on, guys? Thank you, uh, Casey. Thank you, Tom, for having me out here today. It's uh, I, I told these guys before we went on the air that it, it's a pleasure to be on here. Um, I love their work. I've seen their work um, for, for almost a year now, and uh, it, it's an honor to be here. So thank you guys for having me. Oh, thanks Glad for being on. Here with us. As Casey said, my name is Dennis Stanton. Um, I'm born and raised here uh, just outside of Philadelphia, and um, I went to a, a small high school, LaSalle High School, uh, in Philadelphia, played basketball there, and then was fortunate enough to play Division three basketball at a small liberal arts school called Ursinus College. Um, I was blessed to play with a lot of great teammates there, um, who, who are my friends here today? Um, and after after playing in college, I was able to play overseas, and it was obviously a dream come true. Um, being able to kind of see the world, I was never over in Europe, and uh, see the world, learn different languages, meet different people, eat different food, um, and and get to to play basketball for a living. Um, I spent four years over there in Denmark, Poland, Italy, and Spain, and people always ask me, you know, what was your favorite favorite country? And uh, a lot of times, you know, your, your experience is predicated on what's going on on the court. So when you're winning, that country feels really good. Um, and when you're losing and not playing so well, things can get a little bit tough. So um, I had different flavors in every country. Uh, the people were, were always great. Um, but, but certainly it was, it was an amazing experience both on the court and off the court uh, that, that I won't forget. And um, I think... You know, people would ask, did you use your, your college education? I was an English major at Ursinus College, a liberal arts school. Um, you know, how did you use your education when you were a professional basketball player? Um, and I think being able to interact and deal with different people on the court, off the court, um, and different coaches, you know, speaking different languages and things like that, um, you know, I enabled to, you know, was able to use my social skills that I learned in high school and college and things like that to utilize there. Um, and then after after playing professionally, uh, you know, still had the bug for coaching and working with players. And I coached at uh, the high school level at Souderton High School, which is a, a big public school outside of Philadelphia, um, for two years. And uh, what an amazing experience! I was blessed to, to coach really good players. My last year there, I had a Division One player, Division Two player, and and three Division Three players on one roster, um, which is somewhat um, uncommon in a public school. You know, a lot of the times those those kids will get scooped up for some of the bigger private schools. Um, so we were really lucky. And um, and then I moved back to Ursinus College, and I've been there for two years coaching at the collegiate level. Um, and Ursinus College, like I said before, is a small liberal arts school. We participate in the Centennial Conference. We play schools like Franklin and Marshall, uh, Gettysburg College, Dickinson College, Swarthmore, Haverford, kind of a highly academic conference, but also a very good basketball conference. Um, and ever since I, I graduated college um, during the – the summer months, I've always ran camps, clinics, lessons, and um, kind of channel my love. Oh, but it looks like we're breaking up a little bit. That's been a. Oh, we may have lost Dennis. Do you, there for a second do you there. guys? 
Are you there? I can hear you guys. I can oh. hear you guys. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Let, let us know again. Uh, I think you were talking about your channel there for a second. Oh, yeah. So um, my, uh, I have a lot of the videos on my YouTube channel, um, which I'm still, as I told Casey and Tom, still kind of have a somewhat of a rudimentary working knowledge of YouTube and things like that. But um, I, I try to get as many videos as possible uh, from my camps, from my clinics, and things like that. Um, that's at, you know, Dennis Stanton B-Ball. Uh, is my YouTube channel and my Twitter is Dennis Stanton 20. Um, try to post stuff on there as much as possible, but gets ahead of me sometimes. So trying to get better at it. Yeah. So uh, that's awesome. And maybe you could uh, let us know a little bit about yourself as a player. Like, uh, what kind of a player were you? Sure. Um, you know, I always pride myself on, on controlling the things that I can control. I wasn't blessed as a uh, an athlete per se, you know, I couldn't jump out of the gym. I wasn't very quick, wasn't very fast, but I wanted to be able to control, you know, basketball is such a skill oriented sport, um, dribbling and shooting. I wanted to be very good at those skills. And I always believed, you know, my dad would always say, if, if you can shoot the ball, there's going to be a spot for you on the team. So, um, I, I prided myself on being able to make shots, game shots, um, you know, both off, off pick and rolls, off down screens, anything. Um, and then, you know, the limitations, Athletically, that I may have had I, you know, on the defensive end, I tried to make up with just, you know, a little bit of heart, a little bit of hustle. Right. Well, uh, you know, uh, the the reason that that you kind of uh, showed up on our radar was we watched a video where you were at a camp, and you were showing these kids uh, a one arm form shooting drill that you were doing, and uh, I think you you started from about three or four feet away from the basket, and then you ended up kind of in the in the circle near half court. And you had made every shot uh, from those spots uh, on the first try, moving back, and uh, that was that was pretty incredible. So we we knew that you you were a shooter at heart. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, you know my my ex teammates and friends will will never you know let it down that you know I was a shooter. Some some people would call me a gunner at times, um, <laughs> but you know that that's. You know, that, that drill, I, I did that drill, one-hand form shooting. Everyone has done it before, starting in, in the front of the basket and working your way back with, with making shots and feeling good after making shots. I mean, I've done that for 15 years. And um, it was something, you know, one-hand form shooting is something that I truly believe in from a mechanical standpoint because it isolates the shot. Right. And it allows you to just, you know, if you try to do one-hand form shooting with your elbow out, it really doesn't work. If you try to do one-hand form shooting and, uh, you know, bring the ball too far above your head, that's not going to work. So um, that was a drill for me. And every time I speak at a camp, I'm going to speak at three camps this week, and then I have my camp coming up in a week. Um, I always do one-hand form shooting, two-hand form shooting, and then that spin shooting as well. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, using the one-handed form shot, uh, it, it's great because it, it teaches your, your offhand or your assist hand not to have the influence on the shot that some people – kind of end up having trouble with and uh, you know shooting is technically a one arm shot or a one handed shot and if, if you're getting the influence of your other off hand into the shot it's just another variable that can really degrade your mechanics um, so you know that's one of the one of the when we're doing form shooting that's definitely one of the aspects that we focus on is the is the one handed shot right right well and the fact that that other hand we you know everybody else in the world I think refers to that hand as the guide hand um, we don't. We refer to it as the assist hand uh, because that's really all it does. If it goes any further than that, it's getting in the way. And so often, I don't know about you, Dennis, but so often we find that that thumb on the opposite hand, the assist hand, tends to have too much of an influence on the basketball, causes sideways spin, and, and accuracy kind of goes in the dumper. And so yeah. we express that one hand uh, a whole lot in our form shooting as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that I talk a lot about, um, you know, fingertip participation. And if, you know, you want to feel that ball with all 10 fingertips, but if that left hand is participating too much, it's going to have a negative effect. And I know there was one summer, it was after my sophomore year of high school. I don't know where I heard it from. It was at some camp that I that I listened to a guy speak, and, and he said that his thumb was participating too much in the shot. And I was having that problem as well, because, you know, as a shooter, you can feel it coming off the thumb, or you can see it coming off the thumb. So I taped my thumb to my index finger for about a month, and it negated any kind of participation they would have in the shot, and it really helped my, my form. Well, you know, that's interesting that you say that, because one of the things that we do with our students is 
we don't tape it to the finger, but we have them come up and we have them lightly pinch that finger, and then the thumb uh, disappears from the whole program. So yeah. uh, it sounds like we're on the same page on that one, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, that kind of brings up another topic, too, real quick, um, is, is that you have to kind of be your own best coach. And when you're uh, working on your shooting or any other skill that you're trying to develop, you want to be able to analyze what's, what you're doing, uh, see if there's any issues going on, and then be able to uh, implement some way to fix that stuff or mitigate those problems. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one of those things that you just explained that you did when you were working on your shot. And, uh, you know, we try to get that across to our players all the time. You can't just rely on somebody else to tell you what to do. You have to be uh, your own best coach because you're with yourself 24 hours a day. You're not uh, with this other coach more than an hour or so at the most a day or a week or whatever. You're your own best coach. Yeah. Exactly. There's this, you know, I talk a lot about internal feedback. When you are having, a, if someone's working you out or you're doing your own workout, you must give yourself that internal feedback of, when you make shots, what does that feel like? What does it feel like in your legs? What does it feel like in your elbow? What does it feel like in your follow through? What does it feel like when it goes in? Um, and, you know, just as important, when you miss three shots in a row, what does that feel like? And you have to give yourself that internal feedback throughout the course of the workout. It's like any motion, the golf swings, the same way. Like, you have to feel what success feels like in that skill, in that motion. And uh, that's the problem when, when players go and work out with a, with a, a shooting coach and they shoot 80%. And then they score four points the next game, and they shoot three for fifteen. They get confused. Um, you know, it's 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 just not the way the game's supposed to be played. You have to be able, like you said, you got to be able to coach yourself. And and I think the feeling is more important than anything. You have to feel the shot. Um, a coach could say get your elbow, and a coach could say follow through. A coach could say bend your knees. But at the very end of the day, you have to feel what success feels like, um, and that's exactly. going to take a you know yeah. a thousand shots a day. Well said. Yeah, I agree with that one too for sure. Right on. Okay, so uh, one, one of the other things that we saw on your channel is a shooting workout. And uh, this, is, this is something that we get questions on all the time, is, is what, what is a great shooting drill or shooting workout that I can use to improve my shooting? And, uh, you know, the one that you had up on your channel, the, the spin shooting uh, drill or workout, is, is a great one. And I was just wondering if maybe you could explain it a little bit, like what it's all about. Um, and maybe some of the elements in it, and then I will make sure that after we're done here that I'll put the link to that down in the description of this video, and also I'll throw a, uh, an annotation so people can go check that out. So you don't have to give everything about it right now, but maybe just a little synopsis of, of what it's all about and kind of some of the elements of it. Sure, sure, and it's a good segue from being your own coach. You know, when I was a freshman in high school, Marty Jackson was our head coach. He handed me a, a Xerox packet of Steve Alford shooting workout. And, you know, I don't know if Marty's listening, but a great coach, but didn't really explain it. He said, go do this this summer. So I read it, looked through it, um, and I kind of took what Steve Alford did and kind of tweaked it to my own liking to what shots I thought I was going to get in the game and also what would benefit me um, in, in a workout. So the spin shooting workout is something that I developed throughout the course of my career. started, at, you know, after my freshman year of high school and probably did it till I was about 27, 26 you know, my last year as a professional. Um, it's basically predicated on making shots. I start with the one-hand form shooting, the two-hand form shooting, and then I have five basic sets. And some of the core tenets are game speed. So I spin the ball to myself. I sprint at game speed all over the court. I'm sprinting after rebounds. Um, each set takes about five to seven minutes, but it's all predicated on making shots. So I always tell players that if I'm feeling really good, I might be able to get each set done in four to five minutes. If I'm shooting outside and it's windy, that might take me eight, eight or ten minutes. Um, but I try to make game-specific shots. You know, I saw Mike Bibby said one time when he works out, he tries to make shots from everywhere on the court that he's going to shoot in the game. So I kind of took that, tweaked it to my workout. So um, I shoot 15-footers is one of the sets, 15-footers uh, off the dribble, jab step or pump fake, um, dri dribble moves off a ball screen, three-pointers, and then my last set is create your own, kind of doing everything. And and um, it's a purposeful workout that you do by yourself. You need a basketball, you need a rim. Um, you don't need anybody rebounding for you. It's done at game speed. It's effective, game-specific moves, game-specific cuts. Um, and subversively, it works also on your ball handling, and subversively, you also get some conditioning as well because no matter what you do, it's, it's, it's not what you do so much. It's how you do it. And if you do things at game speed and you do things um, with a purpose, uh, you're going to be tired, you're going to be exhausted, and you're going to be shooting shots when you're tired. 
Right, and you know, I think it's one of those things about, we always talk about game speed, game intensity, and the reason that you want to do that is that when you step out on the floor and those other guys are there, you want to feel like you've already done the work there, and, and that's familiar. If you're just casually shooting or going out there and, you know, flipping the ball around, um, that's not going to prepare you for stepping out on the floor and facing other other people. Uh, well, that, that and the fatigue factor is really important, right. too, you know. Uh, you get into the game uh, uh, two or three or four minutes and you get a little bit gassed and uh, you're not going to shoot as effectively if you haven't put that kind of effort into it in preparation. So, at game Absolutely. Speed, game speed is so important. We often get uh, questions. You know, I, I answer lots of questions every day that people pose to us, and one of them that comes up uh, uh, very regular is, Coach, um, you know, I made 12 out of 15 shots uh, from the three-point line and then I played a game and I was two for ten. What's wrong? Well, I don't know what's really wrong, uh, but I got a good idea, uh, and it is that you're not really used to speed, shooting at uh, game speed, and so you need to learn to. I, we have a video also where we kind of talk about consistent shooting and how you kind of get into that, and then that coupled with game speed is real important for you. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, the uh, I did that spin shooting workout every day. And I would do that, that spin shooting workout before any pickup game. I, I could never just go out and play pickup um, yeah. because, as Casey alluded to, it just did not feel comfortable. I needed to get my 500 in and get a good sweat in, change the T-shirt, then go play a pickup game. Um, and obviously, I would tweak that workout on game days, but I could never even warm up before a game without doing my, you know, getting my shots in first um, and feeling comfortable with the stroke um, because it's such a skill-driven. Uh, aspect of the game, you know, it's it's like anything else. You know, if you're going to play 18 holes, you should hit the range first. You know, <laughs> right. And you know, if people watch that video, they can see how progressively your shirt goes from uh, pretty dry to pretty drenched <laughs> by the end. And uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. Not it's not it's not a workout for the faint of heart. I mean, you really got to put in the work to uh, be able to get through it all. And uh, you know, maybe maybe you can give us an idea on how long it kind of takes you to to go through the entire workout. Because it, it's yeah. like it's a, it's a workout on its in its on its own, uh, you know, just in its own right. It's it's not uh, something that's full of. Uh, well, it's just it's just a workout, really. Yeah, there, there's no glitz and glamour to it. You're not going to be you know balancing a, a cone on your head and dribbling through your legs and then trying to throw a sandbag at the rim and then shoot it. It's a it's a basketball workout, um, and basically it, it's you against the game, and you have to be. I mean, to be very good at anything. Um, you have to be, I always tell players, it, it's somewhat obsessive. And for someone to go do that same workout six days a week, seven days a week for 14, 15 years, and I look back, I'm like, you know, I was crazy. Um, but it would be f roughly 45 minutes if I shot very well, and if I didn't shoot so well, it would be an hour. But um, I would be tired at the end of it. I would be exhausted. But I always tell players I would feel good when I was done. I know that I put the work in. And I know that I got better. There's, there was never a time that I did that spin shooting workout, and I didn't think I got better as a shooter, better as a dribbler, better as a, um, you know, a perimeter, better at my perimeter moves, or rip throughs, or jab steps, and things like that. But it was always 45 minutes to an hour, and, and you know, I would cut back some of the intensity on game days, um, and I would, even in like a summer league game. I would do it before a summer league game, and I'd cut back the intensity just to kind of mimic what it feels like to do it, and then play in a game as well. Right. Right. So, I mean, uh, I'll make sure that I link that video to, to this video. Uh, and I, I, people really need to just go out and check it out because it's, it will give you so many tools that you can use when you step out on the floor. You know, you'll be able to shoot off the pass, shoot off the dribble. Um, you'll be in well condition. You'll be able to shoot from different spots on the floor. Um, it's just a really great all-around shooting workout. And shooting and, well fatigued. I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah, and in building up your conditioning is, is a huge part of yeah. playing basketball because you can watch certain guys, the start of the game, their their shooting percentage is way up here, and then as as the quarters progress, you know, it just starts to tail off. And you want to try to not do that because clutch time, that's that kind of comes later in the game. And mm -hmm. you don't want it to be something where you're gassed and not able to hit stuff. So uh, Absolutely. We highly recommend that you guys go check out Dennis's video on the spin shooting workout. And uh, you know we can't uh, say enough about it. It's it's a it's a it's a really great great workout that Absolutely. that we shot science approves. So we that's buy it. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, 
if af after uh, you know talking about all that stuff, let's make sure that we get into questions here before we get too too deep. Um, I want to remind people to make sure they tweet us your questions. We are at Shot Science on Twitter. If you have any question for us or for Dennis, um, anything on basketball, we will try to get to everybody. But make sure you tweet us at Shot Science, or you can post it in the chat or over here in the Q and A on Google Plus, and we will try to get to as many people as possible. Um, um, before we start. Um, Dennis, when we're finished, stick around, okay? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump right into this, Dennis, and uh, you can answer if if you if you want to right away, uh, or we'll jump on it too. But this one is from Nathan Thompson, who is at Nate T underscore AF on Twitter. He says, "What are some drills and things I can do while I'm working out to challenge myself and not just shoot around?" Well, I think we just answered that uh, with the, the spin shooting drill. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things that you want to avoid is just kind of casually approaching your your uh, your your workouts and stuff like that. We see that all the time. People want to see the results, but they they aren't putting in the the appropriate work to have the results show up. Well, you know, uh, one important uh, uh, item, and Dennis mentioned this a while ago, is the fact that uh, if you go out and just shoot around, you're not going to be very effective effective in the long run. You need to perfect uh, as much as you possibly can the elements of that shot where you're going to be successful when you're playing, uh, when you're tired, uh, when the speed is really up there. Uh, you ha you can't just go shoot around and expect you're going to be successful. Any yeah, and I would that? just... Yeah, I would kind of piggyback off both you guys and say that um, in getting better as a shooter, uh, like I said before, it's not easy to work out you know, a specific skill for an hour a day, six days a week, seven days a week. So you have to fall in love with the process. If you if you work out on a Friday and think you're going to play well on a Saturday, that's that's not just not going to happen. It's not how success happens. So you have to fall in love with the process of getting better and each day make it a challenge. That's why I think when you work out, you must it must be predicated on makes, not on shots. Everyone can say I shoot 1,500 shots a day. That doesn't mean anything to me. You know, you have to make 500 shots or make 400 shots, um, and that's the process piece. You have to challenge yourself and make it a game against yourself. I always battled against myself, battled against the clock, battled against fatigue. Right. I think it's it's all about the quality of your workout that really will exactly. will lend to the results. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Here's another one from Nathan. He's saying uh, his favorite quote is "Hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard." Do you believe this? Uh, there's a lot of talented people at my school. I love that? this quote too. I, I I love this quote as well. And you can put a lot of different things in there for hard work. You know, uh, teamwork beats talent. You know, and obviously if you've seen that in the last couple of weeks here with the NBA Finals. But um, you know, it, I love that quote because you know you guys asked a little bit before. What were you like as a player? I know I wasn't the most talented. I wasn't the most athletic player. Um, and I just think in anything in life, you know, hard work, uh, hard work trumps IQ a lot of the time. If you're going to work harder than someone with a, a higher IQ power, um, and I think in the game of basketball, that's that's what I like about the game is that you can have individual success based on hard work, and anybody can be good at this game. Um, but it does, it, it's going to take you know, kind of a plan. It's going to take a process, and you're going to have to really work at it. But I, I like that quote, and I do agree with it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we do too. You can make up a lot of ground if, if you're putting in the work. Yeah. Um, okay, this one is from Cameron Schull in the Q&A on Google+. And he says, happy Father's Day to everyone. Uh, anyway, I make a lot of shots, but the ball goes to my nose when I shoot. How can I get the ball over my head easier? Any thoughts on that one, Dennis? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, I, I see players talk about that a lot. And I see players try to get the ball above their head. Um, and I, I always tell players that's... If you watch someone shoot a free throw, if you tonight, if you watch LeBron James shoot a free throw, it looks like he brings the ball above his head. Um, and I think some players see that and think that they need to get the ball above their head. Or youth coaches say, you need to get the ball higher. You need to get the ball higher. Um, but I think it's more important to think about the motion um, and, and less worry about where the ball goes. Um, the one thing that I say is that it's not like you don't think about get it above your head and then shoot. It's just a, it's almost like it's a path that you stop on. And I teach players right thumb over right eye. So as I'm shooting the basketball, the right thumb will go over the right eye, but it's going to still stay in a one fluid motion. The problem with players thinking about it as get the ball above the head is that it stops and impedes the, the, the strength of your legs. It impedes the strength of the motion when you get it above your head and then try and shoot. 
Um, I try to get players to think more of a fluid motion. But if you're going to think about anything, I like to think about right thumb over right eye and right elbow over right eye on the follow through. I, I like that. I, I like that terminology, and I'll, we're going to take and adopt that today. <laughs> you know, one of the other things that happens in tours, we don't know exactly what this young man is talking about, but so often uh, we find kids who will bring the ball back over the top of the head. And uh, yeah. what we uh, believe about that is the fact that when the ball comes back over the top of the head, you cannot get arc on the basketball very easily. Instead, that arm becomes a lever and it wants to push and it becomes a much flatter shot. And so we're pretty successful with our students just by demanding that that ball never uh, break the plane in front of their face. And I like the mm -hmm. idea of the thumb over the eye. That, that really is good. Yeah, you know, the other thing that, that Dennis was talking about, too, was just the, the fluidity or connectivity of the shot. Right. Um, you know, one of the really big things for us is making sure that there are no sticking points when you're dealing with your shot mechanics. Because if there's those sticking points where the ball stops or your body stops at any point along the, the chain, you lose power. And a lot of times when people are coming up short on their shots or they're not able to uh, step back a little bit deeper in their range, that's usually why is because they have some sticking point where the ball stops or uh, on some point of their body stops during their mechanics. Yeah, what we find, and this would be interesting to hear what Dennis has to say, is that um, oftentimes players will extend those legs and then there's a slight hesitation right there. And then when that hesitation occurs, then there's no follow-through power from the leg, so it's just from the upper body. And so that's something we emphasize a lot. What, what are your thoughts on that, Dennis? Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting point because, you know, I shot the ball pretty well in high school, LaSalle High School, um, and it wasn't until after my freshman year of college that um, one of our assistant coaches, um, he's a very good shooter, Division three player, and uh, he worked on really just getting lower. Um, his, his, his philosophy was low man win. So um, I didn't change too much structurally. What he did was he got me to get lower and think about um, kind of the connectivity piece in that, generating power and using power. So with a good step and a good left-right step in um, and with getting low before the catch and really feeling your legs shoot the ball. Like that ball is getting up in the air because of your legs. Your arms are just following in motion with, with a follow-through. And, um, you know, everyone says that you want this pure shot, and, and certainly you do, but this is an athletic aggressive motion. This down and up, this step in, this follow through, this is athletic aggressive motion. Um, and I think to get players to think like that more so than the minutia of each inch and each ball and where it goes, I think is a little bit, it's, it's easier, I think, for some players to understand, you know, at high school, well, college level, even did younger I, players. Did I hear you say one, two, step in? You're not a hopper? Yes. <laughs> I'm a one, two guy. I'm pulling your chain. I'm a one, two guy. Yeah, so are we. Big well, time. Well, here, you know, here's the uh, other Here's I got a little nervous there for a second. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, here's the other thing that uh, you're talking about. It, you know, and we're on the same page in terms of generating your power. The lower body, uh, your lower chain is kind of the important power generator. You want your upper body to be the more finesse move in the mechanics because that's where you're going to have to have the refined movements that give you accuracy. If you're trying to muscle the ball with your upper body, then that's going to translate to the flight of the ball and to the energy that you put into the ball. And that's going to have, uh, you know, probably negative results once it actually gets near the basket um, or in flight because you, you want that to be very finessed and accurate. You don't want to be putting your, your, uh, your muscle behind the ball using your upper body. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I couldn't let's, agree Let's more. hit up another question. All right. Um, let's see. This one is from uh, Wojcik. Uh, who was at B-O-J-O-S-T-R on Twitter, they ask, uh, many times we're talking about how to shoot, but what should I think if I miss a shot? Uh, what do pros think about when they miss a shot? That's, an That's a great question. It's a good question. It's something that I talk about almost every time I work somebody out. Um, you have to practice missing shots. You have to practice the response to missed shots. Um, you have to practice what it what it feels like to miss shots in a workout, in a practice, um, and also how you respond to that miss. Um, you know, every coach, every instructor says that, you, you know, um, you have to have the same expression and, and you can't let misses get to you, um, but you actually have to train yourself. You know, a coach can say that to a player, or an instructor can say that to a player, but you have to train yourself to respond 
um, to these misses um, because I've had games where I was two for 15 or three for 14, um, and all of those shots probably felt pretty good. Um, but I think it also comes with what we talked about before. Like if you're going to put the work in and put the time in and give yourself that internal feedback on makes and misses, um, that's going to come much easier in a game. That response is mechanism is going to come much easier in a game um, of when you miss, you, you feel that next one's going to go in. Or, you know, you miss one in the second quarter, that third quarter, that next one's going to go in. Um, so practicing your response at practice and practicing your response in, a, in an AU event or a summer league, um, I think, would really help you. How do you respond? Um, you know, there's different mistake rituals and things like that that some coaches teach. Um, you know, I, I, I self-talked a little bit, you know, throughout the course of games and things like that. Um, you know, next shot, next play, those kind of things. Um, but I think the biggest thing, and it's something that we've reverberated this whole time, is that it needs to be practiced. It needs to be trained. Right. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that we spend a lot of time on is uh, with students is cause and effect. Okay, this ball goes in this particular direction, this particular way. Why did it happen that way? And explaining to them, okay, this is what caused this or this is what caused that. And you, it, the more you understand about uh, all of these mechanics and, uh, then you, and what the fix is. And so that uh, if there is some element that keeps throw, uh, uh, jumping up in your shot, that you understand that and now you know what the fix is because you're not going to have a shooting coach uh, sitting on the bench with you the rest of your life. You need to be able to understand all of this cause and effect so that you can make a change and make it right now. One of the things that we talk about with them is, is kind of this, is that uh, sometimes I'll let them take in, uh, two or three shots and they'll, uh, they'll probably look kind of ugly and, I'm, and I'll ask them, when are you going to fix that? They'll give you that blank look, you know. <laughs> uh, I said, you know, you're supposed to be able to understand what uh, is happening there. And when you do understand it, then that's when you're going to start to become a, a pretty good shooter. So anyway, yeah. that's, our, that's our attack on it, Dennis. Yeah, and you know, I think that it's important that people work that that kind of stuff out in practice. Yes. You don't necessarily want that narrative going on while you're in a game. No. Um, when you're in a game, every shot, essentially, you should be thinking that it's a make when you're shooting it. Um, if you're if you're second guessing yourself or you're worried about the one that you missed the last time down the floor, you've already sabotaged yourself. Um, and you you have to think of every opportunity down the floor as a clean slate and you're just putting in the work for that one if the ball's up in the air you have no control over it after that point and if it misses on on that attempt then you just have to come down the floor the next time and that's a, a brand new attempt if you're worried about what happened the last time down uh, you know that that can really uh, set you up for another uh, failure um, you want to make sure that you are just you're you're feeling confident about it really um, okay so let's, uh, let's take another question here. Let's go to the chat. Um, this one is for from BS9 Matthews in the chat who says, any tips for off the dribble shots? I usually can't keep the shot straight because my momentum pulls the shot off. Any thoughts on that one, Dennis? Yeah, it's, um, you know, with shooting, everything somewhat gets tied together. Um, and I think the biggest thing with beating somebody off the bounce, shooting off the bounce, um, is, is that balance. And, you know, some coaches teach the hop, some coaches teach the one-two step. Um, but I think with the one-two step and, uh, you know, for the, for the people listening out there, it's, you know, if you're dribbling to the right, you want to try to step left, right. And if you're dribbling to the left, you want to try to step right, left. And that inside foot gives you not only a sense of balance, but also a sense of strength um, in order to generate that power for the shot. So, uh, you, you, you know, all, all of these questions could be answered with practice and time. But when you're practicing that one-two step off the bounce, you have to think about it as if you jump off two feet after that one-two step, you should end up, in my opinion, a little bit in front. You shouldn't end up right. You shouldn't end up left. You shouldn't end up back. Um, but all that inertia, that positive energy, should be going towards your target, towards the rim, and you should feel that. And I remember feeling exactly what this, uh, you know, this, this person's asking. I remember feeling getting swayed one way or the other way um, and, and – breaking the shot down. I do a lot of chunking. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Daniel Pink's talent code, but he talks a lot about chunking uh, skill development. And so we'll just work on the one-two step and the jump and see where they, see where he ends up without even shooting. Because I remember doing that as, as a high school college player, just you know dribbling hard, jumping, and seeing where my feet end up, and, and just training that, doing that 40, 50 times. Um, so I would suggest that you know, th this 
person that's asking this question to, to really work on a balanced attack with a one-two step and see where your feet end up and, and train where your feet should end up. Right. right. You know, the thing with the uh, with the dribbling off uh, or sh shooting off the dribble is that, just like you were saying, it's very important to do the, the one-two into, the, into that motion because when you're doing that, instead, when you hop into that scenario, you're essentially going from high to low to high, which takes time. And if you're doing the one-two, you're coming in low and going to high. Um, and so you're going to be more efficient at that. And the other thing is, is that you will have more stability, more balance. Uh, it's a more explosive um, kind of uh, mechanism because you're able to stop yourself and gather and go up into the air um, instead of trying to have to stop yourself on two feet uh, from going in that forward motion. You're, you're able to stop yourself with that lead foot, bring in that trail foot, and explode straight up into the air, which is one reason why you'll see those mechanics used for uh, Olympic high jumpers. I mean, that's the same kind of footwork that they're using. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, is, too, is that dribble. When you're dribbling into the shot, you need to make sure that that last dribble is a just a real rocket right out of your hand, and you pound it into the floor even harder than your, your, your previous dribbles. That last dribble will give you kind of a little bit of rhythm, and you want it to pop back up into your hand. So uh, we, we like to teach to do the one-two footwork and then have that real rocket dribble right before you pick it up. Yeah, you know, just another thought on that, that footwork, too, and be interested to hear what Dennis has to say on this one, too, is that oftentimes when we have players who are working on uh, a little dribble to the right or a dribble to the left, and when they plant that, uh, um, we call that first foot the stop foot because we want to stop most of our momentum with that foot, and then the other is the gather foot. But oftentimes when we're going to the side, we'll find that they're off balance a little bit. And what we found is that if they just take and extend that stop foot out about three or four inches, uh, what happens is the center of gravity tends to shift re uh, toward the rear just a little bit, and you get real stable when you do that, just by a little short uh, uh, lengthening of that stop foot or, or the lead foot. Lead trail, uh, one, two, uh, all of those things are kind of interchangeable. So what? any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I like that also um, because it also you're getting more distance, um, you know, yeah. away from the defender, away from where you're trying or, or where you're trying to go to, um, and and that it, it's so important, you know. And, and when we do form shooting, you know, we make sure, you know, I know you guys do this as well. You put your left foot in the instep or the curvature in your right shoe, and then you bring it shoulder width. Um, and I actually like the imagery that you used in one of your videos underneath the armpits. That might because sometimes you work with seven year olds, you say shoulder width, they don't know where their shoulders are. So. Um, <laughs> But I really like that piece of really kind of extending that step. Um, and I will also add that when you're working on balance off the dribble, um, you're probably going to have to slow that motion down. Um, right. you know, you're not going to be able to just go 100%. We talked about game speed, you know, make a quick jab, make a quick pump, or you know, simulate a ball screen and go one, two, and, and jump. You're going to have to slow that chunk, that, that skill down a little bit. Right. Yeah, I mean, we're we're really in the camp where you want to break everything down. If you need to, uh, you know, work on just uh, the the footwork, get that down because that's probably the most important part is just getting the footwork down, and then you can start adding in the other elements of of what you're trying to build. Right. And you know, maybe that's just working on uh, the dribble, uh, the footwork, and the address, and then you can start adding in the actual shooting uh, uh, motion and stuff like that. Um, Absolutely. But, but, uh, you know, with the one-two, um, you know, there's, I think there's a little bit of misinformation about that, too. Like, people are assuming that on the one-two, in terms of if you catch the ball, you catch and then step one-two. Or when you're dribbling, you're, you're dribbling, you pick up the ball as you're taking the one-two. The, the fact of the matter is, is that it, it is starting before you pick up the ball. It is starting before you catch the ball. And so what happens is that you are eliminating part of all of those mechanics before you even catch or pick up the ball, which will make it more efficient, it will make it quicker, <coughs> uh, excuse me, and, you know, it, it will just help, uh, you know, eliminate some of the stuff that you have to go through to get the shot off, which will make your shot quicker, because you want to rush your feet, not your finish. Um, hmm. if, you, if, you're, if you're going through and rushing the finesse mechanics of your shot, that's when you will lend the tension, uh, more energy to the ball, and you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you're rushing the stuff that uh, where where that kind of fine, refined movement isn't going to affect your shot. So it's things like your footwork. 
Um, so that, that's just my thoughts on that. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's let's take another question here. That was a real in-depth one. <laughs> um, this this one is from Anthony Artiega in the chat, who says, "How can I get better at offensive dribbling when driving to the hoop? Is there any drills I can do? Uh, I know this stuff is off-topic with shooting." Okay, well we're we're taking anything basketball questions, so that's that's all good. Um, but uh, any any thoughts on developing your offensive dribbling or your dribble attack to the hoop? Yeah, I think um, you know. I think getting three or four quality moves, um, both off the catch, um, you know, when, when you dribble alive, you know, a jab series, a jab and go, jab and cross, jab and pump and go, um, having that kind of package, that kind of arsenal, and then having three or four, you know, a crossover in and out between the legs, behind the back, whatever it is, you know, just simplifying what you're doing on that initial set because you guys know as well as I do, you, you can't make, you know, more than two moves. You've you got to be really good at one, two, three moves. And then I think the biggest thing is I heard someone say the other day, uh, the best players play in straight lines. So once you get that space, once you make that cross and you get that east-west and you get that guy on your hip, you need to play in a straight line. Um, so thinking about, you know, the, the geometry of those moves when you're working out and thinking about that straight line and thinking about um, the space that you need to get off the bounce. Um, I teach players a lot is just shift body shifting. So shifting your body on a crossover, um, shifting your body on an in and out, and then playing in a straight line after that um, to get to the rim to finish. Um, and I would say also I'm a big proponent of playing one-on-one. -on -one. So, uh, you know, once you're done your shooting workout, once you're done, you know, wh whatever workout you're doing or pick up, playing one-on-one -on -one because if you want to get better at rim finishes and getting by someone and finishing a, uh, around somebody, you need to feel what that feels like because anybody can, you know, do double crossovers between the legs and, and make a really nice, you know, off foot layup, uh, reverse layup. But if you need to feel what it's like to have some contact, to have someone on your hip, to have, you know, to, to take that space, um, that would be my suggestion. You know, it's interesting too. I think um, when players are learning how to uh, attack off the dribble, is that they almost always circle around and they don't take that straight line that you're talking about. And I was working with a young lady last week and, and, um, I said, this, you have to get this done. She can really shoot it. She's a freshman, uh, about 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 she can really shoot it, but she, she, does, she won't go to the basket. And, and I said, well, what's the problem? And she says, she kind of granted, I don't know. And I said, well, we, yes, you do. What, what is the problem? Well, I don't want to get hit. Well, uh, <laughs> and, and so I said, well, when was the last time that you can remember seeing anybody being taken away in an ambulance after they drove? <laughs> and she kind of chuckled. And, and so I said, you know, in reality, basketball today is so much more aggressive that you have to learn not only to deliver uh, um, contact, but also to accept it and still be effective. And, and, um, the one thing that happens is that you cannot replicate that just by going one on none. You have to have somebody there who is challenging you so that you can develop not only the move, the quality of the move, but also uh, to see what it's going to feel like, just like you were talking a moment ago. So uh, that's kind of our take on it, or my take on it. I don't know if Casey feels the same way or not. Yeah, I mean, I think Dennis is echoing like all the stuff that we, we teach all the time and we hit it in these live shows and stuff, and that is, uh, you know, you want to have a, a kind of an arsenal of, of, of attack dribbles and attack moves and uh, it's good to have two or three of those and and then have a counter off of those as well so if you're if you have the crossover dribble down you want to be able to do the in and out and you want to be able to do the hesitation uh, you want to just have uh, one one dribble attack and then maybe one or two counters off of that and just specialize in those and know how to create space using those attacks because that is really what you want to be able to do is create space off of the dribble. Um, and definitely the east-west, north-south stuff needs to be hammered home every single time we deal with this stuff. Uh, you know, when people loop out and around, you're essentially, uh, you, you know, you're, you're putting the move in and then you're letting them back into the, into the play. And if you're going north-south with your directionality, you are essentially eliminating those people because you're a step ahead of them at least and you have pinned them on your hip. Um, and so if they try to come back into the play, they're probably going to foul you uh, or bump you when you go up for your shot and, and they're in a bad place. You are in control, so make sure that you are going north-south on, on everything that you do on the dribble attack. Which, in translation, means, as Dennis said, uh, a straight line. 
<clears throat> right. Well, I mean, he used, <laughs> he, he used the same terminology as us. So that, that, that's definitely. <laughs> okay, let's, let's hit another one of these questions. Here, this one is from uh, STL, who is at STL underscore David Boss, who says, do you believe the leg swinging motion gives you more range on your shot or kicking your legs out when you shoot? What do you think? Uh, I'm not a proponent in it, uh, of it, rather. Um, and again, I think sometimes uh, you'll see very good basketball players do that, you know. And a lot of times, the swinging, kicking motion that he's alluding to is based off of uh, a player trying to create space. You'll see it a lot on a step back. So a player drives in with his left, he steps back as he's shooting. That momentum with that step back is creating that swinging motion in his lower body, um, and it's. You know, I, I think to be as consistent, and we talked about before, the simplification of the shot. You know, we complicate the shot a lot. Um, so as you bend your legs, generating that power to use the power to get the ball to where you want it to get to, you know, we always talk about the last step of the upper body is obviously a consistent follow-through. The last step of the lower body is that both feet are jumping. Both feet are um, generating that power and getting off the floor uh, to shoot the shot. And... Uh, there's no reason for you to be kicking your feet anywhere. You know, you should just be using your feet to to, to jump. And and so I think um, I don't think that the kicking motion helps any players. But I think sometimes we see it on TV because these players are contorting their bodies to get space off of players that are just as athletic, just as fast, just as quick, just as strong. And uh, sometimes it leads viewers to believe that that would be the correct way to shoot the ball. But um, right, well, I would. Oh yeah, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I mean, <clears throat> we are we think uh, you know exactly the same thing. I think when it comes to to the leg swinging out thing, I think it's it's a little bit misappropriated because what what you need to realize is that when you're shooting, you're shooting straight up and down, and you're bringing the ball out in front of yourself. And if you think about physics, you have to realize that your center of mass shifts when you raise your arms up, and then your arms are going out in front of you. So when you do that, your center of mass shifts up and out. And to compensate for that, your body naturally learns that it has to kick its or move your legs out to compensate for how far your arms are going out. Um, and so what you're seeing a lot of times is that uh, people's bodies are compensating for that forward position of their arms because their center of mass is moved. And if you watch somebody like Kobe Bryant, who is known to have a pretty flat shot, and brings his arms out much further than, than most guys do. He, that's why his legs swing out more is because he is actually uh, putting his arms out further, and so your body has to compensate. If you're watching guys like uh, Kyle Korver or uh, Steph Curry, they aren't doing that so much because they're more uh, elevating vertical. their shot vertically. Vertical, yeah. um, and, you know, the other thing that you were alluding to, Dennis, which is super true, is that you don't want to add more variables into your shot. Because if you do that, those are those are areas where you start to degrade. Um, those are areas that can go wrong, and you want to make sure that you're being as efficient as possible. You don't want to be complicating your shot. You want to be simplifying it because it's more repeatable, uh, which will make it more uh, accurate, and you'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, have your shot be there more often. Right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I definitely agree. And I think if you watch Kobe Bryant shoot a corner jump shot, a wide open corner jump shot, you'll see that he's going to use more legs and the, and the legs will less, you know, they're not going to flare out as much. Um, but I definitely agree. And I love those examples of Corver and Curry. In fact, there's a spe there's a two minute video, I think on ESPN, I th think it's sports science on Steph Curry's shot. You guys would love it. And they talk about the one, two step. Cause I know sometimes the knock on that footwork is people think it takes too much time. But here's a guy that gets shots off better than anybody in the league, and he does the one-two step, and it, it actually expedites his shot. Um, oh, yeah. Well, you know, here, here's one thing, too. I mean, you bring that up, the, the one-two uh, of some players and the hopping in of the other players. But, you know, what, you, what you'll what you find a lot of times is that the guys that, that hop into the shots, are uh, they're, they're doing it from a stop motion, you know? And when you step one-two into the shot, you're, you're shortening the pass, and you're also generating rhythm, which is really important. So um, if you watch those guys, a lot of the times the really great shooters are stepping into the pass one, two, because it helps shorten the distance of the pass and also gives you the rhythm to go up into your shot. Any thoughts on that, Dennis? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those things where, like we've, we've talked about, that energy, inertia. You have to have some positive energy going towards the ball and right. also towards your target as well. Um, you know, it, it's so important, and I think it's, 
and the timing of that's important as well. Casey alluded to it earlier. You need to meet the ball, um, and that step needs to be one, two into the ball at all times, whether it's off a down screen, whether it's off a transition pass, whether it's off a kick out from the post, uh, go meet that ball. And what's, what's also important, especially for three-point shooters, is that you're not lining the three-point line. You need to be a foot behind, foot and a half behind, so that you have that space to step into your desired spot. Right. You know, um, just a little thing that we kind of do. Uh, you know, I've never been really very enamored uh, with uh, the triple threat position. And the reason that I haven't is that most of the people in this part of the country seem to teach it that you, you catch it without any real footwork and you bury the, the ball down on your hip. Um, and I never really like that as an approach, and so we take an, uh, another approach, and that one is we go with catch and address. And so what we, we do, and we kind of kid the kids a little bit about this, this is all about rhythm with your feet. And as that ball is coming, you're taking that first initial little short step uh, toward the basket, and as you catch the ball, you're making that turn into the basket, and it's ready to go. You don't have to shoot it, but if the shot is there, you're going to get a little bit of a jump on that defender. But keeping the ball in a situation where you can shoot it as opposed to having to possibly be delayed and get it into the shooting position. But the key point for us on this, Dennis, and I would love to hear what you have to say on this, is that uh, we think that footwork is so important for generating rhythm. And, um, and rhythm for your shot. And the, we find the dipping of the basketball does the same thing, but we're not proponents of that because we think it just, number one, it exposes the ball to the defense, and number two, it takes too long to dip it down and bring it back up to shoot it. And it's an extra variable, too. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Dennis? Yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of simplification of the basketball shot. And I also... Um, like you said, you're going to get that defender to jump a little bit and, and not so much like jump at a shot fake, but once that ball, you know, gets above, you know, the belt buckle and gets, if there's any threat for it to shoot, um, yeah. that defender, whether the coach is telling him to keep his head down or to stay down, I mean, he's going to move, his body's going to move, he's, he's yeah. going to react to that movement. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big proponent of utilizing the basketball. Um, I, I don't talk about triple threat either, utilizing the basketball as a threat, even on a jab step, like, Jab step, most people that teach triple threat say keep the ball like at your chest on a jab step. Well, I, I have found a lot of success as a player using the ball as a threat, using the ball, leg, and eyes for the jab step. So all the three elements are going to the same spot, and that defender is going to bite on one of those three or maybe all three, and then what Casey said before is you could take that space. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of the same you know, teaching viewpoint there as well. I, I love that approach. That, that's really good. That's really good. Okay, lightning round. We got we got to shorten up some of these answers. Uh, <laughs> people, we can here in the last few minutes. But uh, okay, so this one is from Eric Rucker or Rucker, who is asking. Uh, I have a pretty decent jumper, but the shot is not perfect. It's kind of flat, and I'm guessing I'm rotating my hip a little bit. Would you suggest to change my jump shot, or should I stay with my actual shooting form since I'm still getting buckets? What do you think, Dennis? <laughs> Um, I think, you know, I think arc and rotation are so important in the basketball shot. Um, and when I made those changes in my shot my freshman year of college, uh, the, the coach telling me to get lower, obviously it gave me more lift. It gave me more arc on my shot. So I would say, you know, even though you're getting buckets and you're feeling good, I think it's going to be important that you try to get a little bit more lift. And I, I teach players that you shouldn't really look at the ball and see where it's going each time, you know, as far as arc. But Think about the motion. Think about the rhythm. Think about where your elbow is and think about where that elbow ends up on the follow-through. Um, look at the good shooters and look where they are following through. Look at the Steph Curry. Look where his follow-through is, how high that elbow is, how high that snapped wrist is. Um, so my advice would be to focus on that. And subversively, you're going to get more arc. And, um, you know, because flat shots, you know, we talked about before, you know, if you get the ball up a little bit more, it's going to have a, a better chance to go in. And, and right. I would always analyze how shots are going in. I remember uh, listening to Tiger Woods, and he was on a putting green beforehand, and he's making putt after putt after putt, you know, 8-footers, 12-footers, and the, the people asked him afterwards, you were making everything out there. And he's like, yeah, well, I didn't really like how they were going in. Um, you also have to analyze how your shots are going in. So if you're getting buckets, but you're zipping that ball in and zipping that ball in, um, you want to take a peek at that too. And I think if you get a little bit more arc, they're going to be going in a little more fluidly through the basket. Right. Right. I mean, it looks like they've done a little bit of the work here, and they've they've figured out some of the issues that they're having. 
uh, you know, the next step is is adding in, the, you know, the the fixes that you were talking about. So, you know, this person is already working on being their own best coach. They just need to do the implement implementation of of the fixes. So, yes, we're with you on that one too. Um, okay, so let's remember lightning round. Here we go. <laughs> um, let's see. This one is from from Abagnale510, who says, Happy Father's Day to you guys. I'm 20 years old, and I've always had the dream to play in the NBA. Do you know of any basketball leagues that are age 18-plus or 20-plus that could benefit me to achieve my dream? Hmm. Um, well, I would say, obviously, collegiately. You know, if, if you're not playing collegiately, just just try to try your best to get in the gym. Try your best to get on someone's radar, whether that's a junior college or community college or, you know, Division three, Division two, NAI, whatever it may be. Um, that would be your best vehicle to the NBA. Um, there's obviously minor leagues like the D League and the ABA and the CBA and things like that, but uh, very difficult to, to make those rosters if you're not on a collegiate roster. Um, and I think that and you guys can attest to this as well, if you could get some stuff on, on footage, even if it's a summer league game or um, a rec league game, send it to some college coaches to try and, you know, get that next step to fulfill in your dream. Right, right, right. That's important, no question. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you answered that exactly the way that we would have. Yeah. That, uh, you know, you got you to gotta do your own legwork a lot of the times, and it's going to be a tough road. Um, and also one thing that I would say, too, is set smaller uh, goals or milestones. Uh, if you're if you're setting the ultimate goal as the NBA, that's that's going to be tough to just get there. So set some smaller goals, like I'm going to play for this rec league team, or I'm going to go play for, uh, or I'm going to go try out for this this uh, collegiate team, or whatever. Smaller little uh, tidbits that will help you get there along the way, um, or stepping stones. Okay, here's one from uh, Sean Lewis in the chat who says, as an eighth grader going into high school, what's the biggest thing that needs to be worked on in the off season? Hmm. <laughs> that's a that's a loaded question. Well, for the lightning round, um, I would definitely say try to uh, have a plan, have a seven day week seven day a week plan um, where you are incorporating dribbling, shooting, uh, conditioning, five on five, uh, and you know in in the realm of conditioning, lifting, and have a, a seven day work week plan where you know what you're going to be doing every single day, and you need to devote you know three hours a day. There's 24 hours in a day. Three hours of the day needs to be devoted to, to shooting, playing, and, and doing some kind of strength or conditioning work. Um, that would be my best advice in order to put yourself in a better position come you know ninth grade. Right. I mean, you need to train with purpose, and you need to have a plan. And uh, you know, one of the one of the big things is knowing what your weaknesses are and trying to bring those up to uh, the level of your other skills and trying to be the best well-rounded player that you can be because. The more valuable you are as an all-around player, you know, the better opportunity you're going to have to play at any position, anywhere, at any time. So uh, we're kind of on the same page with that, right? Yeah, just one added note here. One of the things I think is important when you are at this particular point in your career is that the jump to high school oftentimes is quite a di difference from eighth grade. And one of the things that I note with players that I have that are students is that we really work hard on speed of execution and uh, learning how to get those moves, how to do the, uh, the footwork and whatnot. But then once we're kind of getting it down, then we get into speed of execution because the speed of basketball as you go uh, uh, up the scale gets uh, magnified a whole bunch really fast, and you have to be able to play at that level. Any thoughts on that, Dennis? Yeah, absolutely. you got to mimic you know, the setting that you're going to be in. You know exactly. I mean, at this point in your, your, your life, being in eighth grade, you know who's trying out for that ninth grade team. You know who you're going to have to beat out. You know probably what tryouts are going to look like and pickup games are going to look like. So uh, try to take, through that lens, try to take that and, and put that into your workout. Uh, into your shooting workout, into your dribbling workout, if you're a post player, into your post workout, um, and do it, as, as, as Coach said, effectively and at game speed and purposefully. Right. Okay, so we have one last question here, Dennis. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is from STL again, at STL underscore David Boss, who asks, does turning your feet when shooting make your shot crooked? Um, I'm guessing he's alluding to the initial setup of your feet. Uh, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Yeah, so I, I think the biggest thing is that um, I teach players that we want our right foot slightly in front of our left, and what that does not only does it create balance, but that right foot gets our right shoulder in line. I do a lot of alignment work, and having that right shoulder in line, having that right elbow in line, having that right follow through in line, but what really starts that is from the bottom up with your feet. Um, so, and when you talk about turning your feet, 
they could be slightly offset. Um, but certainly, if you're facing the basket, you don't want your feet on a 90-degree angle to the left if you're a right-handed player, uh, and, and conversely to the right if you're a left-handed player. But I, I think they can be a little bit offset, you know, to, to a certain degree. Um, and obviously, when you're jumping, your feet should end up slightly in front. They shouldn't turn in midair. You shouldn't have them, you know, flailing in midair or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, I think we're we're exactly with you on that one. You want to make sure that you do have a little bit of a stagger because you you're lining up everything on your shooting side. Um, you know, we don't have our arm coming out of the middle of our chest, so squaring up your body completely probably isn't going to be the best way to have the best mechanics. If you get that slight stagger or turn, you're going to line up your shooting wrist, your shooting elbow, shoulder, hip, knee. Uh, ankle, all those things will be in line, and you will be much more accurate that way. Well, and the um, other thing that's real important, and Dennis talked about this uh, at the start of the show today, is that you want to have that ball uh, above uh, the shooting eye. So often yeah. we have students, and I bet you can identify with this one too, Dennis, is that we have students who come in and they've been told to square up. Um, and that's the first thing we change right there, because when you square up, you have a tendency to shoot the ball off your shoulder. Now, Absolutely. Truly, I've seen some pretty good shooters who shoot off their shoulder, but I've also seen some uh, players that can't shoot at all off their shoulder. So anyway, and, that and, shortens and, that question. Yeah, and the other thing, too, that Dennis brought up is that you don't want any movement uh, after the fact. You want your feet set kind of in the stagger that, that you're going to go up with. If you're trying to do any twisting or turning or kicking or anything like that after you've gone up into your shot, Again, you're adding in, an, in another variable. Something can go wrong. Uh, you, you're going to uh, potentially add that into the, the mechanics of your upper body. So you want to make sure that you're not doing that. You want to have your feet set and go straight up with that. Okay. So I want to thank Dennis so much for being here, Coach Stanton. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, you nailed all these questions here today. And, and I want to make sure that we send everybody to go see Coach Stanton's videos. Uh, you know, his spin shooting workout is definitely a, a must-watch for everybody. If you want to take your shooting to the next level, I think that would be a great place to start. Um, and it gives you a full workout that you can do pretty much any day, anywhere. Um, and also go check out some of the other videos that he has up on his channel. Um, and make sure you follow Coach Stanton on Twitter. He's at Dennis Stanton 20 I believe, on Twitter. Um, yes, sir. So uh, any, anything else that we can send people to to check out? Um, I also have a website, DennisStantonBasketball.com, and I kind of cherry-picked videos of the spin shooting and different form shooting videos and stuff that we've done with clinics and camps, so uh, everything's on there as well. Um, but and I want to thank you guys for having me on here. This was a, a pleasure. I, I, I'm, I'm working in the realm a lot of college basketball now, so to just get to specifically talk about shooting was a joy, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. of course. We'd love to have you back on, too. Yeah, so. you bet. That's been great, Dennis. Yeah, yeah. so stick, stick around for just a second, um, and we'll it. Here. But uh, I just want to thank everybody for showing up for today's um, uh, live show and make and you know if you ask a question we didn't get to it it wasn't because we didn't like you it's just because we ran out of some time um, you know make sure that you're here again next week 1 p.m. Pacific time for another live show on Sunday um, and if you want to send us your questions during the week you can do that too we we are at Shot Science on Twitter we are on Facebook and Google Plus every day make sure you're subscribed to us on YouTube as well we put videos out all the time up there. We put one out the other day on reading rebounds, so you might want to go check that one out. Um, and we will see you guys again next week. All right. All right. See Thanks you guys so much. Next week. See ya.